So anyways, hi, I'm Kevin Williams, and uh, again, I'm here to talk to you about information security and uh, uh, Star Wars and what I call Death Star threat modeling. Uh, the objectives here is we're going to talk about the basics of what threat modeling is, identify threats, risks, vulnerabilities, uh, how this can be integrated into a software development life cycle, and then basically we're going to use Star Wars to kind of uh, aid in the comprehension of all this. A uh, little disclaimer, of course, no way uh, endorsed by Lucasfilm or Lucas or any of that junk, and uh, this will hardly be the worst case of copyright infringement you'll see here this weekend. <laughs> a little background, this is just the, basically the, uh, I'm not some joker off the street, I kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, I hate to admit it, I was a Fed prior to this. Uh, you know, I was in the Air Force 10 years, uh, three years of that I did information warfare. Uh, currently I'm a, a consultant, uh, getting paid for being a know-it-all. Uh, my background's in software engineering, and currently I'm a grad student uh, in information security at Our Lady of the Lake University. Uh, plug for them. They're one of the 80 NSA certified centers of academic excellence in information assurance. So this is one of my favorite quotes here. This is from Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Uh, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, will be, you'll suffer a defeat. And then if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you'll succumb in every battle. Or in layman's terms, know thyself, know thy enemy. So he wrote this 2,500 years ago, but it's as true then as it is today. And this is kind of the essence of information security and why we have to do threat modeling. So what is threat modeling? It's basically we're anticipating possible attacks and figuring out ways to fix this. So, you know, I, I think we've all had that, that look there that Vader's got that, uh, you know, what do you mean your car got towed at 2 in the morning when you're at the strip club kind of look? Um, <laughs> I, last month is another story I'll tell you later. Uh, so, you know, the primary goal here is to figure out, you know, how we can be attacked and then, you know, how we can go about prioritizing to fix those. So I use the term Death Star Threat Modeling because it's really easy for people to grasp. It's, it, it's, it's a common memory. Everybody shares it. We all, we all uh, know as soon as we say that term what we're talking about. And I've used this for years with, you know, my troops in the military and then my, you know, my coworkers now to explain what these things are. You know, because people throw around the terms threat and risk all the time that, oh, you know, go, driving down the highway is risky. Well, I mean, that doesn't mean the same thing as it does in information security. They have very specific uh, words. So it's really good to get everybody on the same page. So if you're in a room with somebody and they say, you know, the, so are, when you say threat, do you mean what I mean when I say threat? And, you know, this right here, I'm sure we all remember this game. This is kind of the essence of what we're talking about, you know. What's the chance of the X-Wing getting that proton torpedo to go down that little hole? So this is uh, basics of Death Star threat modeling. So first off, you have your asset. That's a valuable resource, right? This would be your, your application, your website, uh, the, the program you're coding, what have you. And that has a vulnerability, which is an exploitable weakness. In this case, it's the, the exhaust port that somebody didn't put a screen over. <laughs> and then there's a threat. That's the thing that's going to come in and it's going to try to do harm. It's going to try to exploit that vulnerability. So then the risk is the chance of that occurring. So what's the chance the proton torpedo is going to hit the wall versus it's actually going to go down in the hole? And then lastly, a countermeasure. That's something that you put in place to reduce the risk. And this, you know, in a sense, is threat modeling. But in this context, we, you know, we use a little Star Wars clip art to help you guys remember. So let's break these down. Your asset. This is anything with value. Now that value can be perceived or it can be literal value. So there's things that uh, uh, you may consider, you know, a commodity or resource like, you know, disk space or your IP addresses or something like that. You know, to an attacker, these can, you know, these have value to them because they can leverage them to do other nasty things. You know, and basically, if it's worth having, it's worth protecting. And, and that goes for everything. Vulnerabilities. This is an exploitable weakness. It's something that's not supposed to be there, and it can hurt you. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. So this can come in the form of unintended functionality, bugs, glitches, errors. These are things that happen that you didn't expect to happen or intend to happen versus intended functionality, which is design flaws, you know, assumptions in the code. Uh, well, oh, it never occurred to me that they could use that portion of my application to hurt me or somebody else. These are still vulnerabilities, whether or not, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a glitch or an error. Threats. This is what is causing you harm. It can be a person, it can be man-made, it can be a uh, natural, a natural disaster is a threat. Uh, you know, maybe not something that we always think about when we uh, uh, look at information systems, but you know, uh, uh, you know, HVAC, fire suppression, you know, uh, UPSs, those kind of things are countermeasures to natural disasters. 
And it really doesn't matter what the intent of that threat is. Uh, you know, it could be the insider threat, somebody who's intentionally trying to hurt you, doing it manually. It could be automated, somebody just doing ping sweeps, what have you. So it doesn't matter if it's chosen and discriminate, it's all a threat. And then the risk. Again, that's the likelihood that the threat's going to cause harm. So the little pseudocode here that, you know, the threat probability plus the severity of the vulnerability equals your amount of risk. So the more likely something is to happen and the, the worse it will be if that thing happens, the more risk you have. And you just remember, you will always have risk in any system. If you didn't have risk, then you basically wouldn't have a system. So you're not going to have anything that has no user interaction, that isn't online, that isn't storing something that's of some value. You know, if you did, it would you know, be a self-contained running thing. So a countermeasure. These are the controls that reduce risk to an acceptable level. That's the key word is acceptable. You're never going to get rid of risk. You're always going to have risk. And there's always going to be things that you're not going to know that are going to hurt you. But the uh, basic idea is here is to balance it against both the risk and the asset. So again, a little pseudocode here. The, the cost of the control, you know, that is whatever it is we're implementing, has to be less than or equal to the asset. Otherwise, it's not worth it. You know, we're not going to spend a you know, million dollars to protect something worth 100. And then the protection that we're implementing has to be you know, stronger or at least equal to the risk that's happening. You know, otherwise, it's not worth it. And so, so how do we use threat modeling? Okay? This is just the, the basic you know, five-step process. The first thing is identifying critical resources. You've got to know what you have if you're going to protect it. So then you've got to figure out you know, how it can be harmed, stolen, broken, what have you. And so these, again, are your assets and your vulnerabilities. Now, now critical resources is, uh, is completely you know, subjective. What's critical to one person in one system is not critical to another. You, know, uh, you start thinking about it, you've know, you got a, a web application, so you've got the, you know, the, the web layer, you've got your routers and your servers, and the database layer, and then the backup. And, you know, so then you have to make some sort of determination which of those is the most critical. You know, if something's got to go down, which one can I, can I uh, uh, accept? And then two, it's just the best guess is what's going to cause harm. So you just got to look at these critical resources and say, okay, what, what are the possible threats to my web server? You know, I, I, you know, I could be hit by a flood, I could be denial of service, et cetera, et cetera. And these are what your threats and risks are. Next, you want to determine every possible way of preventing or reducing the damage and then compare the cost and implementation. What we talked about, countermeasures. And again, just brainstorm. So you, you sit there and think, okay, so I'm, I'm worried that somebody's going to denial of service my web application. So what are the things I can do against that? Well, you know, I could do load balancing, I could do some sort of this or that, or, you know, I could just take the thing offline. That would that, be a way of stopping it, right? So, but then, no, step four, we want to implement the best control and, and evaluate it, right? So, uh, my e-commerce site is taking it offline the best solution to that problem? So, maybe not. So, then we want to document the, you know, those results and lessons learned, you know? So, you know, uh, dear IT staff, I found out that taking the web server offline is not the best idea. So, and the most important part of step five is continued process improvement, is to take what you learned and go back and do it all over again. So now let's, uh, let's go through and identify all the parts that we just talked about. So asset management is key here. Y you know, you got to know what you have again, where it's located at, you know, who's responsible for it. How do we get another one? You know, if the server goes offline, can we get a second one somewhere? And don't lure yourself into a false sense of security with that idea, well, you know, that happens to other people. You know, nobody would want to attack my system. You know, we'd argue that if you have a system, it's online, it accepts user input, it's going to be attacked. Vulnerabilities. Now, this is the, this is the hard thing to find is because if you knew there was a vulnerability there, you, you wouldn't have to look for it. You know, you would probably fix it. So th the hard part here is we're trying to find something that may or may not exist. So we want to uh, both look at it internally and externally, doing things like penetration testing, you know, white box, black box scanning, looking at it from the security from the outside looking in or the inside looking out, source code analysis, looking at it um, in both a static and a dynamic state, you know, uh, executing the code or also looking at the code itself for flaws. And again, you know, back to Sun Tzu, you have to know yourself and the enemy. So you've got to know, what you, know what's in, what you have going on in your own system. So identifying the threats, you're never going to know all the threats that are out there. You know, the, I mean, the, your, the best thing you do is make a best guess, you know, an educated guess. You know, stay current, you know, with a, you know, current events, read the blogs, forum posts, what have you. And the best thing is be proactive. Don't wait till you're attacked. Don't wait till somebody, you know, uh, hits you before you do something. And then uh, identify areas where the CIA triad is affected. And this is kind of like a 